This video is made possible thanks to your support over on Patreon.com. And this video is sponsored by NordVPN. And then he said to me, Wow, Spice, you really are the most charismatic person I've ever met who's won an Olympic medal for having a big penis. I... Oh. Sorry, close personal friend Tom Hanks. I've got another call coming in. I'm gonna have to chat to you later. Hello, this is Spice 8 Rack, aka 100 Very Angry Bees. How can I help you? Hello, Spice! It's charming and multi talented YouTube personality Cory Not Cory here. Listen, I was just calling you because I was doing some research for the podcast I host, and I stumbled across some Magic the Gathering cards. Wait, real quick. Is that podcast that you're referring to The Psy Guys, the highly entertaining and informational science podcast that you can watch right now on YouTube, listen to on Spotify, and download from the Apple's podcast app? Uh, yes. Wow! This is perfect! With your understanding of science, I can finally make concrete progress on answering what kinds of psychosomatic illnesses best capture the mechanics of milling and discarding cards in magic! Yeah, that's, um, not why I'm calling at all. Wait, it's not? No, 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 no. I just saw this card shark to crab and I need to explain to you why it's actually almost possible in real life. Oh, neat! Well, that's a much better video idea than the drivel I was planning. One second. <sighs> Maybe next year. Maybe. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to throw up uh, an actual <laughs> content warning at the start of this, saying that we're gonna talk about horrible things that people do to animals. I wasn't <laughs> expecting this to be one of the videos I have to do a content warning for. Good God. Hello, spicy people of the internet. Spice Arak here, aka Isambard Kingdom Brunel, but with really big shoes on, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we have the wonderful, amazing Not Cory with us, who's going to be looking at some of uh, Magic the Gathering's cards, specifically to analyze the scientific, uh, I guess, like, realism that might be found within this wonderful card game's depictions of mad science. But before any of that, let's say hello to Not Cory. Not Cory, why don't you why don't you bloody say hello to the the audience? Whoa. Hello the audience. Hello, how are you all doing? <laughs> yeah, do you want me to say who who am I? Yeah, who who the fuck are you? Yeah, I'm Cory and I'm a YouTuber, I guess, but I also have a podcast. It's a science podcast where we basically take a science story and have a chat about it, have a laugh. It's a good one. You should check it out after watching this video, I think. Or, no, no, check it out after watching this video. Definitely wait to the end of this video and then check it out. It'll be linked down there, say, I think. I don't know. <laughs> you're gonna poach my audience in the middle of your own feature. You, you prick. Thank you so much for um, joining me today. I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to blast through a couple of Magic the Gathering cards that uh, like have some kind of link to science and then Cory, you're going to explain to both me and my audience because I'm a complete layman whether or not the kind of science that is being depicted on these cards if it's realistic, if it's possible, if a scientific equivalent exists or if it's just complete uh, batshit ludicrous mad science. Uh, so I'm really genuinely very excited. All right, so let's, I guess let's just kick off with the very first card. I have a list here. Uh, and the first card that we are going to uh, talk about, which uh, actually became the namesake of this project. It's saved on my computer as Project Inflation Station. Uh, the first card is Inflation Station from Unstable. Inflation Station is a contraption that whenever it gets cranked, uh, target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. And we can see on this card, uh, chickens being filled with air to like two or three times their size, like balloons, and then them floating away in the background. So my question to you, Cory, is, is it possible to inflate chickens in the real world? Is it possible? Yes. Is it ethical? Probably not. No. So when you inflate a chicken, um, it will probably die <laughs> because it would pop like a balloon. Um, I have found out stories of people inflating chickens, uh, but they were already dead, basically to add weight to them so you could sell them for more money. But in terms of inflating a chicken to make it float, 
you probably wouldn't be able to do that because it wouldn't be less dense than air. If you were to inflate it with helium or hot air, you might be able to make it float. But again, you'd end up with a dead chicken before you ended up with one that was floating. I, hang on, like, when you say like inflating them after they're dead to like, is that, is that to like trick scales into making like, making it feel like this chicken is like heavier and denser than it actually is? I mean, people would literally put their mouths on dead chickens and blow into them so that when customers tried to buy them, yeah, the scales were tricked. Apparently you could make a one, one and a half kilogram chicken about two kilograms just by, just by blowing into it and then tying it off. Yeah. Holy, holy shit. So I had, I had <laughs> no idea. I was going to put this, I was, I thought this was surely going to be a fucking bad science thing. Um, well, in that case, it, it, it is mad it's science. So not, it's just real. It's just real mad science. Well, in that case, I guess we've got to put it down on, on realistic. Is it entirely possible for you to inflate a chicken like a balloon? Um, okay. Wow. I, okay, well, this is a, this is a wonderful start because I'm already, <laughs> I'm already super unsure of literally everything else that's on this list now. Can we just say, don't inflate your chickens at home. Just don't do it. You're, you're going to end up with a dead chicken or a lovely roast, but it, it's... <laughs> Your chicken won't enjoy it. I want to say to everybody who is watching, um, it is, uh, we are scientists uh, and chicken farmers are allowed to do whatever they want, but you, you're not, no, that's not the line I'm going with. Chicken farmers are not allowed to do whatever they want. They don't get immunity from the law because they're a chicken farmer. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on. Oh, we're gonna move sorry, on. sorry, hold on. Uh, I, you, you can't arrest me for murder. You see, I farm chickens. <laughs> I almost fell off my fucking chair. <laughs> okay, all right. Next, next card. Um, uh, one of the biggest. Uh, obviously, we had the inflation station from Unhinged, and the plane of Babylonia is just full of mad science. You know, this list could be exclusively about the plane of Babylonia. But of course, there are other mad scientists uh, throughout the whole multiverse. <laughs> as a as a as a non magic player, what is happening right now is you're saying a lot of gibberish. And then you say science things, and I understand what you're talking about. One of the most famous groups of mad scientists in the entire of the multiverse is, of course, the Is It League. And it is to those scientists that we are now turning for our next card, which is Street Spasm. Uh, so Street Spasm. Oh, burps coming again. Oh, pardon me. It's all that water you're drinking. I, what? It's what? How does water make you burp? Because you swallow air whilst um, ingesting water. Um, or ingesting anything and that sits in your stomach and then it comes up because you can't be filled with air. Boom! Extra science! <laughs> Fuck! Okay, I'm gonna put that on realistic. I can be inflated like a balloon. <laughs> okay, back, back, to the, back to the fucking video. Jesus Christ. Street Spasm. Now, Street Spasm is a instant for uh, one red and X uh, where Street Spasm will deal X damage to target creature uh, you don't control without flying. It, of course, has overload for two X and two red. Um, and what we can see in this art is we have a bunch of wizards shooting lightning at the ground uh, so that it sort of buckles underneath what I can only assume to be like the power of lightning. Uh, so my question to you, Cory, is can you use electricity to cause the earth to move? I... I tried really hard. Okay, when I read this one, I thought it was the entire earth moving. And I tried really hard. I tried ion thrusters. I tried just using brute force of electrons. I tried a lot of stuff. Mm. Not, not personally. I, I looked into <laughs> it. <laughs> just see me shooting electrons at the ground. No, I looked into a lot of different things and I couldn't find a way for this to work. You could potentially destroy something with lightning, but actually making the earth move in a way that you want it to, unless it was magnetized, isn't really possible. Okay, so like it's, you could cause, you know, like a large amount of lightning to like shift something, but in, it would be very difficult for you to like have any kind of control over that whatsoever. Yeah, you could, you could cause something to superheat with an, and then explode and then, you know, it would move that way. Or you could, uh, you know, use electricity to create a magnetic field and move something that is, uh, you know, magnetized in some way. But in terms of actually controlling it with electricity, um, it's not, it's not really real. Nah. Okay, I'll put that one down for mad science then. Again, talking about the is it now, 
Um, but sort of uh, on the on the opposite side, as it were. Here we next have another card from Ravnica, Abrupt Decay. And of course, in the art, we see a is it Cyclops being affected by Golgari corruption. Uh, Abrupt Decay is for one black and a green. It's an instant. Can't be countered by spells or abilities. Destroy target non-land permanent with converted mana cost three or less. And in the art, we can see this cyborg, this cyclops being rapidly, uh, rapidly deteriorating amid some kind of super fast corrosion. So, Corey, my question to you is, does anything exist, organic or synthetic, that could cause this kind of abrupt decay? Yes, and I wish it didn't. Um, so there are a lot of things that can burn skin. Plenty of things that can burn skin. You've got a bunch of acids that can do it. You've got lye that can do it. If it's heated to like 300 degrees, it can dissolve an entire body in three hours. Uh, there's also hydrofluoric acid, which is horrible and you don't want to look up. I promise you, you will not enjoy it. Basically what that can do is poison you and also burn you at the same time. In fact, it destroys your nerve cells so that you can't necessarily feel it burning you I've heard apparently there are stories of people who have had you know their gloves have uh, but like sort of burst they've got a leak in their gloves and they've been working with hydrofluoric acid but they haven't noticed until they've taken off their gloves and literally seen the burns because it destroys your nerve cells but that isn't the worst one that I want to talk about the worst one I want to talk about is the strongest acid that we know of it's fluoroantimonic acid and that can just destroy you it can burn through glass, it can burn through metal. The only thing we can keep it in is plastic. It explodes on contact with water. So if you were to spray someone in that, yeah, they'd probably pretty quickly not be a thing anymore. Jesus Christ. What's the, what's like the point of having that kind of stuff lying around? <laughs> like what's the scientific point of having like super strong acids like that? Scientists are crazy. No, there are a lot of different things that we can use these for. So I think hydrofluoric acid, you can use it for um, making, I think, Teflon, things like that. But really, if you want to sort of, um, if you want to cause certain kinds of chemical reactions, you can use these acids to do that because they're very reactive. Okay, so that's that's unfortunately in the realistic column then, I'm assuming. I really wish it wasn't, but it's it's gotta go in the realistic column. Well, I also wish that inflating chickens to be balloons wasn't like a <laughs> thing that people did, but here we both are. All right, uh, we're sticking on the Ravnica theme. Don't worry, we're not gonna just stay on Ravnica. Uh, with the pursuit of flight. Now, pursuit of flight is a enchantment for one and a red which you can enchant a creature. Uh, enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and has, if you pay one blue, this creature gains flying until the end of turn. And we can see in the art, we have this Viashino being ejected into the sky on a pair of electrical wings. So my question to you, Cory, is, can we use the power of electricity to fly? Well, if we are spiders, then yes, because spiders actually do this. Some spiders basically- Pardon? No, spiders actually, yeah, they use the power of electricity to fly. So they um, go on to sort of the edges of sort of branches or leaves and they spit out sort of a little bit of silk and basically through electrostatic forces, they can fly or float for, I think about a thousand miles or a thousand kilometers. I can never remember which is which. Um, they can float for a very high distance and they can be seen up to about two and a half kilometers in the air just floating on these electrostatic forces. And, and so, uh, again, I'm a massive layman. When you say electrostatic forces, that's different to like, like just rising hot air. What, what, does that, what does that mean? So what I mean by electrostatic forces is effectively something can be positively charged or negatively charged. You can see that when you sort of rub a ruler on yourself and it can pick up little pieces of paper or static shocks. That's uh, different charges sort of equalizing. So there are different charges in the air and spiders use those different charges to kind of give themselves some kind of lift, effectively. Does that make sense? That's, yeah, no, that makes sense. So when you, um, like, so when you, for example, like take off a jumper in the dark and you see like loads of sparks, that's that's the equalization of electrostatic forces. Yeah, that's kind of, st that's static energy sort of, that's static electricity just equalizing effectively. And what spiders are doing are using differences in charge to fly. And it's not the same as flying on the wind because spiders that are too big to fly on the wind can do this. And it eluded scientists for years until quite recently. It's really, really cool, the fact that they can just do this, and we hadn't really figured out why until the past sort of 10 years. That's absolutely wild. So like that, in that case, because it's not, 
like obviously like a spider can do it but maybe not like a lizard man so i'm not sure it's like falls into the realistic but i guess like a, it's an equivalent like would you say i think it's an equivalence yeah because you you could you could potentially do it if you built the right stuff but it's much easier just to build a plane so it's true an electric plane yeah would be <laughs> would also do the trick the next one moving away from ravnica entirely to the ghoulish Frankenstein-esque plane of Innistrad. And here we see, there were loads of things that I could have uh, drawn from, but I think the one that really jumped out to me was Brain in a Jar. Now Brain in a Jar is a two mana artifact that has pay one and tap it, put a charge counter on Brain in the Jar, and then you can cast an instant or sorcery from your hand uh, with converted mana cost equal to the amount of charge counters on Brain of the Jar. You can also pay three, tap it, remove the charge counters and scry. Um, but that's not important. The mechanics of the card are literally not relevant at all to this discussion. What we're really caring about is a brain presumably being kept alive in some kind of liquid and with electricity. Um, so my question to you, Corey, is can we keep a brain or like another vital organ alive, as it were, in a jar. Well, look, brains in jars have been things in science fiction for as long as science fiction has existed, basically. And we really, really like that idea, and it's getting close to being possible. So we can keep other organs alive, not necessarily in jars, but out of the body. There are some terms I'm gonna be using, by the way. So you've got in vivo, which means in living things, ex vivo, which means outside of living things, and in vitro, which means in glass. So keeping a brain alive in a jar would be keeping a brain alive in vitro and ex vivo. And we can do that with lungs. We've got systems that can keep lungs breathing between transplants that have come about recently, which are really useful. Um, we can grow sort of organs outside of bodies. Um, we've grown, I think, a small brain and a small heart in a jar, essentially. Uh, but the closest we kind of got to keeping a brain in a jar is almost reviving dead pig brains. So we had decapitated pigs. There are a lot of dead animals in this, by the way. We had decapitated pigs. And what we did was effectively try and stimulate their brains to get them working again. And we had some brain activity, but not necessarily enough to say they were alive. So we're on the track to making brains alive in jars, but it's not necessarily possible yet. Really, all you need is a blood supply and the right environment. Uh, but it's quite difficult to create that. So we're we're on the way there. Potentially possible, I would say. But um, a brain sitting in a jar right now, it's gonna be a dead one. Fair play. Um, I'm learning. I'm learning a lot about how how bastards um, uh, scientists are. Um, <laughs> just about like being horrible to pigs and well, actually, it's not the scientists being horrible to chickens. I'm sorry. I'm hung up on the. I'm hung up on the balloon chickens. Honestly, honestly, after almost two years of doing that podcast, I realized that scientists are just horrible, horrible to animals. And no one really thinks about it, but it happens. So this one falling into the possible category, you say? I, yeah, I want, look, I want to believe that it's possible and we're almost there. So yeah. I would definitely say pop that impossible. Okay, that's going in, that's going impossible. It means that it's not, it's not something that we can do now, but we're on, on, very much on the way to doing it. Speaking of things that we are potentially on the way to do, well, I don't know, maybe we are, maybe we're not, um, that I certainly hope we're not, uh, let's talk about Sharkdo Crab. So, jumping back to Ravnica for a hot second, uh, Sharkdo Crab for two, uh, sorry, for two, a green and a blue, you can create a Shark Octopus, Octopus Crab, sorry, with a dapped one, uh, and whenever one or more plus and plus encounters is put on Shark to Crab, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature does not untap during its controller's untap step. And we can see a monstrous hammerhead shark that is crossed between an octopus and a crab. So, Cory, ca can we make Shark to Crab? That's the question. Uh, you know, we can make a shark to crab? Can we make the shark to crab? I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> we put a lot of different genes into a lot of different animals. If you've seen like a glowing rabbit or fish, it's probably because it's got a jellyfish gene in there. We're really good at putting genes in other things and making them do what we want. But when it comes to sort of growing limbs and uh, you know, sort of shark and crab parts, 
maybe not as possible as we'd like. We have made a mouse that has a human looking ear on it, but uh, that wasn't an actual sort of human ear. That was just mouse stuff shaped into a human ear shape because we hate animals and we love to cause them pain. <laughs> We really fucking do, Jesus we Christ. We do, we do. Yeah, no, so the thing is that you can technically make a sharktopus uh, by sharktopus? Sharkta crab. You can Sharkta make a shark crab. Thank you very much. Sharktopus. <laughs> Get out of here with your wild science fiction. We're talking about sharkta crab. <laughs> We can make a shark to crab as in an animal that has shark, crab, and octopus genes, but a sort of multi, uh, sort of multi, sort of limbed creature probably isn't as likely as you'd want. Okay, so would we say that's like, that's like unequivalent because we can technically have a shark with crab and octopus DNA, or would you say that like it's mad science because obviously the kind of shark to crab we're looking at can't happen? You know, I'd say it's an equivalent. I'd say it's an equivalent, but it is also mad science because it's mad science in the real world. <laughs> That's the issue with these categories. There is a lot of real mad science. There is a lot of science that is both real and absolutely batshit. On the topic of transformations, uh, and back to the wonderful plane of Innistrad for this one, I'm gonna talk about Docent of Perfection. Uh, now for Magic fans, you'll know that this is the uh, the fifth stage in the uh, sort of like Delver of Secrets timeline, as it were. Uh, this is the fifth stage. This was printed in Eldritch Moon for five mana, two blue and three of any color. You can create an insect horror with flying. And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a 1-1 one, one blue human wizard creature token onto the battlefield. Then if you control three or more wizards, transform Docent of Perfection. But as again, we don't care about the uh, abilities on this. We're just looking at the art, which is this insect formerly a human, concocting a potion to then turn other humans into similar insect monsters. So, Cory, can we teach insects to do chemistry? And is there a potion that will let me turn into a bug? <laughs> <laughs> a double he double whammy on this one. Okay, I think I've got you here. So we don't need to teach insects to do chemistry. A lot of them already do their own chemistry. Fireflies have got really cool chemistry going on inside of them that produces light. But my favorite one is the bombardier beetle, which mixes two different substances, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone, uh, to make this uh, sort of reaction that superheats, um, this, that superheats everything and then sprays out of the beetle potentially killing any insects that want to attack it. It's literally doing chemistry inside of its own body. So insects can do chemistry already. What we don't need to teach, teach that to them. Yeah, That's... no, genuinely. Is that, Han, is that like uh, stuff that exists inside the beetle's body or does it like go out and get things and like <laughs> fucking mix them together? <laughs> it's got a fucking um... shopping list for death breath. <laughs> It is on a, look, all bombardier beetles, right, are on a list in the US. They're on a no-fly list, honestly, uh, because, of their, <laughs> because of their purchase history. Now, um, well, they do store them in two separate sort of parts of their body. I don't know whether they produce it in their body through their diet or whether they eat, they, they probably produce it um, somehow through their diet or get it somewhere from their food because that's how most animals get most things. Um, but yeah, they genuinely do that kind of chemistry. It's ridiculous. That's fucking wild. But there is a second part to this. Is there, Cory, please, you've got to lay it on me. Is there a potion that's going to let me become a bug? I need to know this. I've got a desperate need. Spice, my friend, I... I'm sorry to say that I don't think there's a potion that can make you a bug. We can- We can put a mouse on an ear, but we can't turn me to a bug. This is- What's the fucking point of science? What we- What we can do, what we can do, uh, sort of a consolation prize here, what we can do is put bug genes into you. Now, you probably won't be growing bug parts, but you can produce some bug proteins, which might be cool, I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> we can also, we can also, um, Modify, <laughs> modify your body to look more like an insect um, by making it grow things in certain places, like we did with that mouse with the human-looking ear on its back. 
But the issue with actually trying to grow, well, the issue with trying to turn one animal into another using genetic manipulation is that if you're doing it with a fully grown animal, you've already got a lot of sort of that animal parts uh, to get rid of and a whole load of new parts to grow. So it's really, really taxing on the animal and it's much more likely to die than it is to grow bug parts and be all happy and good. <laughs> Okay, well I'll put the I'll put the <laughs> the teaching insects in realistic, uh, which was again not something that I was expecting to do at all. Uh, and I'll put the um I'll put the potion in mad science then. Like there's no Absolutely. there's no foreseeable way that I'm gonna be able to like uh, go to my fridge like pull a uh, pull a tab on a can have a drink and then become a firefly. Look, as much Despite. as I want you to be a bug person, that's just, it's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> supporting my dream and actualizing my desires. The next one, Capture Sphere. Now, technically this is on Ravnica, but it's uh, pretty uh, universal, this sort of magic um, across the uh, planes of uh, Magic the Gathering. Capture Sphere, for three and a blue, you get an enchantment aura with flash uh, that has enchant creature and when Capture Sphere enters the battlefield, tap Enchanted Creature. Enchanted Creature does not untap during its controller's untap step. And here we can see some kind of ogre or troll being held captive in a sphere of energy. So, Cory, answer me this. Force fields, are they actually a thing? Yes, but maybe not in the way that you want. The Earth kind of has a force field. It's got a magnetic field around it that can deflect sort of certain particles away. Uh, different planets have got different magnetic fields. So yeah, force fields do exist, but maybe not enough to keep an ogre or a troll contained unless it was made of tiny, tiny little particles that weren't at all connected to each other. You're basically, basically, what you're looking at when, um, when you see sort of the sort of Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, that's the Earth's force field working against sort of tiny particles that are incoming towards Earth. But, um, yeah, we don't have, like, sort of hard light force fields, and we can't really make them. So, eh, is my answer. My scientific answer is eh. Fair play, I... <laughs> You know what? I can get behind air. Air I understand a lot more than half of, <laughs> half of the stuff that's been going on. So to sort of like wrap this up quickly before we move on to the next card. Uh, force fields, realistic, possible, or equivalent. Like I think, judging by what we've talked about, they could, like you could put that in almost either, uh, any of those really. You know, I wanna, I wanna say possible. I'm gonna say possible because the depiction on the card is improbable, but you could hold something somewhere using magnets, I guess. That's a good answer for anything, isn't it? It's always magnets. <laughs> it always is. How do they even work? Who knows? Like every three months, I realize I don't know how magnets work. And then I look up how magnets work and by three months later, I've forgotten again. So I need to look it up. I think we're in, we're in sort of maybe month two right now. So it's leaving, but it's still, it's still there. Okay, okay, we'll move on. We'll put magnets into mad science. <laughs> there we go. Okay, our next card is, uh, this is a bit of an older one, actually. We have Serpent Generator. So for six mana of any color, you can get an artifact that has pay for and tap. Put a 1-1 one, one snake artifact creature token into play. This creature has, whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that player gets a poison counter. And we can see in the art, it, what looks like a meat grinder is having some kind of matter poured into it, and then snakes are just popping out of the other end. So my question to you, Cory, is, is it possible to create living creatures using only raw materials and machinery? Yes, kind of, kind of. The thing is, right. Okay, so it depends what you mean by raw materials. We've made bacteria that have got completely synthetic genomes in them. So the entire genetic information of that bacteria has been made by people. The raw material would just be the rest of the bacteria. Um, we can also grow certain sort of organs and parts, but in terms of making things just using machines, that's quite difficult. We tried making sort of cell parts, but a lot of the time they fall apart. There are scientists working on it, but 
we're not quite there yet. You could make, say, a test tube baby, but at some point you would need to take those raw materials, you know, the sort of sperm and egg and all of that, and chuck it into a person to grow. And really, the thing is that life just kind chuck of just it on in there. The Pop. There we go. <laughs> chuck it on in with consent. The thing is that life, <laughs> life already is a machine that takes matter and makes more life. So you're so wise. It doesn't really make sense to try and make another machine that does that. You know, you've already got a perfectly good snake making machine already. It's it's called a snake. <laughs> Fair, I mean, fair, fair fucking play. Um, well, I get in that in that case, it's like it's not it's not mad science necessarily because both the as you said, like we're we're not there yet, but feasibly, we we have like the building blocks that we could eventually get there. Is that like an equivalent or a possible to you? Would you say a meat grinder that you pour stuff into that just prints out a snake? Uh <laughs> I think that's more, I think that's- Alright, well maybe that's- Okay, when you put it like that, okay, maybe it's not possible. Look, the thing is, right, I think it's an equivalent, to be honest, because we can- we can sort of almost print lab-grown meat, um, but printing mm. a living animal- Why would you do that? You've got- you've got animals that make animals, it's just easier to use one, one of those. So yeah, an equivalent, I think. Now, we're gonna end on a card that I- like I said at the start of this, I had a vague idea of where lots of these would end up. I've been proved pretty much universally wrong um, on every single one. Uh, but this one, I genuinely have no idea like where it could end up. And we're going to look at paradoxical outcome. So for three and a blue, you get an instant with return any number of non-land permanents you control to their owner's hand. Draw a card for each card that was returned to your hand this way. And we can see on the art, uh, we can see an elf teleporting a vase or what looks like a vase in some kind of like a magical golden ring. So my question to you, Corey, is, is teleportation or like the vanishing of one thing and then the reappearing of that thing in another place, is that actually possible? Yes, yes, but not necessarily at the scales you want. Well, okay, let's talk about teleportation and what it really is because teleportation of people is basically just cloning, but with murder involved. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, it is. But you know, fair play. I can't. Yeah, I, I go go off, King. I can't. I can't. Dis I can't disagree with you. You're the scientist. <laughs> Uh, so when I say we can teleport things, what we've been able to do is use quantum entanglement to sort of um, not transmit information, but uh, make photons change or be the same um, at different distances. So basically what quantum entanglement is, it basically means that two separate sort of uh, quantum particles uh, will change in accordance with one another or stay the same in accordance with one another. Um, despite the distance between them. You might have heard this be called spooky action at a distance. This is not a perfect explanation of it, but uh, effectively, that's what you usually hear when you hear people talking about sort of quantum teleportation, using quantum entanglement. But let's say that you could use that to transmit something or teleport something that was bigger than a photon. Uh, what you'd want to do is break that thing down into its individual smallest parts so that you can basically scan every single part of it. Now. If you were to do that to a person, it would obviously kill them. But what you've now got is data on where every single individual piece of that thing was, where every single molecule, where every single atom, where every single electron sort of was at that moment, let's say. You could then take that information and sort of transmit it somewhere else and build the thing again. But in order to do that, you need to completely destroy the thing. So if you want to teleport, sure, but you're gonna be dying an awful lot. Are you telling me that every single time somebody says, beam me up, Scotty, in Star Trek, <laughs> Scotty is murdering the fuck out of them and then just rebuilding their body <laughs> elsewhere? Dude, he is super murdering them. Like, all the time. You could make, like, that, that technology, you could effectively just make a death beam so long as you don't transport them anywhere else. <laughs> Insta kill. Scotty's the real fucking villain. What the fuck? <laughs> so it's not necessarily realistic to like 
transport a, a vase. Let's stick with a vase and move away from the human murder. Um, a phrase that I love having to say on my channel more than once per video. Um, let's, so let's move to the vase. It's not realistic, but it's, it is possible to do theoretically. It would involve scanning every single like molecular component of the vase individually though. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. It's basically one of those things that if you look at some, some parts of science, it is theoretically possible, but laws of physics kind of get in the way a little bit. So I would say that it's an equivalence because it's kind of like squinting mm. at what we can do in the real world and uh, making something from that. It's not quite mad, mad science. It's, it's got a little, it's got a little, mm, a tiny little shred of something in there. Fantastic. Well, that's really interesting to know because in a coincidence, I have another thing that I'd like to talk about that is also an equivalence of of teleportation. Do you want to do you want to know what it is? I'm very It's today's to sponsor it NordVPN. Yeah! Has this ever happened to you? Oh, no. I'm in the UK. And if that wasn't bad enough, you also can't watch region-locked content like full episodes of the newest series of Spitting Image. However, with NordVPN, you can trick the internet into thinking your laptop or other device is in a different country, like... Uh... Um... Uh, I, I don't know... Uh, S Slovenia! Now I can sit alone in my office and gently blow air from out of my nose at a slightly higher rate than I would have otherwise. Fantastic. Now I can circumvent a problem that shouldn't exist in the first place. Thanks, NordVPN. And you too can do just that and more thanks to this offer from NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash spice 8 rack or use code spice 8 rack to get a two year plan with a huge discount plus one additional month for free. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Okay, so that's every, that's all the cards that we were going to have a look at. So just to review, we have in the realistic column, uh, so like I'll throw up some like tier list-esque thing. Everyone loves the look of a tier list. We have um, the, inf the, we've got the chicken inflation, which is great. Um, we've got the abrupt decay. Uh, we've also got me. I can be inflated as well, technically. We have the, <laughs> we've got the ability to teach insects chemistry, which I was not <laughs> expecting that to be in there. Uh, the next one down, of course, we've got the possible, which is the brain in the jar, the capture sphere. Uh, those are the only two that are in the possible. Uh, in equivalence, we have the pursuit of flight. We have the shark toe crab. Uh, we already have par a paradoxical outcome, and we also have the snake generator. Uh, and then in mad science, we've got street spasm, uh, and we have... Mag oh, <laughs> I couldn't read my own writing. I was like, we have street spasm, we've got the docent potion, and then what's this? And then I've remembered that I've put magnets in mad science. Uh, so there we go. That's that's our that's our tier list. Those that's science in Ooh. Magic the Gathering ranked. Um, what was the most what was the most interesting card or like concept that you had to do some research oh. into? Because these are all fascinating. You know, I think I think it was the abrupt decay because I just I, I'd heard about hydrofluoric acid before, and I got to find out about fluoroantimonic acid and I got to watch a lot of videos of uh, chicken chicken legs being <laughs> being dissolved in acid. Ah, I can now finally see you are a true scientist because you find pleasure in being really mean to animals. <laughs> it was a dead. It was a chicken drumstick. It was already dead. I'm gonna have to. I'm dissolved. gonna have to throw up uh, an actual <laughs> content warning at the start of this, saying that we're gonna talk about horrible things that people do to animals. I wasn't expecting <laughs> this to be one of the videos I have to do a content warning for. Good God. Um, no, but thank you. Like, aside from all the horrible nightmares I'm about to have, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your your understanding and your expertise. Uh, this has been this has been one of the most fun like videos I've ever shot. So thanks so much. Um, but yeah, if you want to just um, remind the audience of who you are and where people can find you. Hello, audience, again, I'm reminding you of who I am and where you can find me. No, I'm Paul. 
I'm Corey. You can find me at not Corey literally everywhere. That's N O T C O R R Y. It's on the screen. Why am I saying that? You can also check out my podcast, Sci Guys. We do science stuff every single week so you can find that on youtube spotify wherever you get your podcasts all that and yeah yeah just don't find me at my house that's the only place only place i don't want you don't do that you can find us online but not in real life that's exceptionally intrusive um and that's everything thank you so much to everyone for watching and i'm gonna uh, gonna do a, like a little cutaway and i'm gonna thank all of my lovely ten dollar patrons as well and thank you to nordvpn for sponsoring this video and say goodbye, Cory. Goodbye, Cory. <laughs> and it's goodbye from me. And as always, stay spicy. And then I'll do a little turn around in my chair. And a massive thank you to all of my patrons. Uh, some of them you can see on your screen and some of those I will read out now. So a big thank you to... One, two, three, four. I declare a class war. Seventh guest, a fool of five colours, a gay American couple, a malevolent benevolence, a socialist hobgoblin. Adam Gable, Addy DC, AJ Ingram, Alex Berman, Alex Flynn, Alex Wood, Alice Perales, an old fight sleeper agent who gives money to communist Buka Idika, open parentheses, probably Tibbles for Sona, close parentheses, an Umbreon pastry, Anna Lisa Milano, Anthony Baker, Anthony G. Reap, Avery is a good magic player. See Joe, the thespian said it, now it's true, stop making fun of me. Bambi Roper, Basu Gasu Mbaku Hatsu Baku Matsu, Ben Pike, Biscuit Blade, Blake Evers, Bradley Rose, Brian Dunn, Cairns, Cal Lulu, Carl Comstock, Chase Beard, Chad X, Chris DeVos, Serso Saressa, Cloud Chaser Kestrel, Cognitive Glitch, Conflicted Psyches, Corwin Stoddard, Darius Rudeminer, Deadpan Goth, Dollar Wen, Drew Pierce, Dystopico, Exidian, Eldritch Changeling, Elfonzi, Erica Hamel, Ethan Abraham, Felix Mortem, Fiona Perry, Future Beagle, Grey Days, Willow Me Mercia, Hand It Over, That Thing, Your Dog Pictures, Hoop it up. I am saying this only because our global economic system does not intrinsically support artistic expression. In response, I bolt myself. Is it even metal if no goats were sacrificed? <laughs> that's a that's a very uh, fitting new patron to be reading for this particular uh, Patreon credit. Uh, Jake Colburn, Jessica Settle, Joe Benson, Joey Denbroeder, John Solog, Johnny Rifle, Joshua M. Stephan, Julie Bunn, Julius Holm, Just Mild Lilac, Carlia Whithart, Kabuki, Cole Marks is my spirit animal, Kate B, Kevin Quinn, Curdape Apologizer, Leliana, Lily of the North Star, literally a ghost that pushes over candles, Linnea, Madame Monroe, Magic Arcanum, Matthew Boris, Mike Mathromatis, Mirrorhead, Mr. Skeleton, N. Ben, Omar al Oops, all signy, Ori, Sharkto Crab Appreciator, Penny, the Great Charade, Buck, Rakavar Kavali, Riddle of Lightning, Ross King, Rowan Brown, Ryan Morgan, Ryan Pavlik, Sage Morrison, Samuel Kona, Sasha Evelyn Francis, Sean Caius O'Reilly, Several Goblins in a Trench Coat, Sheepwave, Silent Celine, Sir Seanzy, Skurs, Sky Johnson, Soda Man 64, no relation to Pepsi Man, Swan Hunter, Taylor Street, Felon, The Reaper of You, Totally a Spy, Trans Rights Baby, Trey Ernst, Trey Parker, True Lily, Vittorio Grace, Vladimir Gorbachev, Voice of All, Wicked Haiku, Xenon, Zadda's Ludo Narrative Dissonance, and Xanoron. Thank you all for supporting the channel, thank you to you for watching, thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video, and thank you of course again to Cory for jumping in and making this a bloody delight. And as always, stay spicy. Uh, oh Jesus, I just, I almost ripped my <laughs> headphones out of my computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's gonna be. I can't. That's gonna be. That's gonna be how I end the video then. See ya. <laughs>